thank you, Father. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the Holy Spirit applying the word, helping us to understand it and helping us to apply it to our own lives, to our own situations, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to continue from last week. And I started something which I've used these passages before, but never like this, never in this way. And so we're looking at turning things around. Is that what we're talking about? The Bible calls it breakthrough. Turning things around. Uh, our joy and the mission of our life is for you to know Jesus, for you to know the Word of God, and to equip you to prepare you so that you can hear from God directly and get results yourself. That's the ultimate. Uh, when you're small or young in the Lord, young biologically, uh, but young in the Lord too, you depend a lot on other people, right? But then, uh, so diapers are changed and, and we feed you the bottle and so on. But then when you're 10, 12 years old, you can't cry if you're hungry, right? You just go to the fridge and there it is. Does that make sense? So it's good to depend on other people, but the ultimate goal, especially for a pastor. Now, God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We all have different gifts, different callings, and we need all of us. That's why God gave all, because we need all of us. But especially a pastor's joy is to see people grow up in the Lord. So I, I teach you how to get results. It's the greatest joy. When you say to me, you know, I prayed like you taught me, or I, I meditated in the Word like you taught me, and, and, and I, I turned things around with my faith in God, and I got results, and now I know how to do this, and then I'm going to help other people to do this. I want to teach other people how to do this. That's the greatest joy for me. That's the greatest joy for a pastor. Amen? So we're talking about turning things around. And I gave you a number of principles last week. I put a couple on the PowerPoints just so that we can uh, use these and then build on this and talk about this, right? So we looked at the woman with the hemorrhage. Do you remember? She was hemorrhaging for a long time, and uh, she just turned things around. So if you, the, the teaching is online, it's audio and video, you can go to a website and, and see it or hear it, whatever you prefer. Now here are the distilled key principles from last week. Go ahead, uh, put the first one up, go after, there you go. Uh, decisions and not circumstances determine my future. Decisions and not circumstances determine my future, all right? And then the other key point was this. Your internal dialogue, how you talk to yourself. Uh, use whatever term you want. Uh, uh, modern psychologists use self-talk. There are some people, they say, I don't believe in psychology and so on. Now, I, I think there's good psychology and bad psychology. But uh, if you don't like self-talk, don't use self-talk. But how you talk to yourself or your internal dialogue as long as it's in the Bible, you want to use it. You can change a label, and uh, uh, self-talk in the Bible really is meditation. Meditation is muttering the word to yourself, is talking to yourself. But if it's in the Bible, then we're going to use it. So I'm, I'm not too uh, uh, worried about labels, okay? Just switch the label, but how you talk to yourself. The woman we saw last week, she kept on saying to herself, if I only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. If I only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. That's, how, that's what we mean by self-talk. And I, I just realized this is exploding in these weeks inside of me as I prepare for you and pray for you, how much self-talk in the Bible there is, how really important it is. So then I got this in my heart yes, uh, last week, last Sunday, in the office before I came out. To do this for three Sundays in a row, uh, let me correct that, to do the three times in a row, okay, three times, all right, and uh, um, um, apply it to different people in the Bible. So we used, for example, the woman with the issue of blood last week. 
concerning sickness and disease. Now this week we're going to find exactly the same principles. And I'm going to go to a well, well well-known passage, one of the most famous in the Bible, when David slew Goliath. All right? So why? Because Goliath represents as the archetype, represents problems or difficulties in life. So this will not only work with sickness and disease, but it will also work with any problem or any difficulty of any kind. And I was just really surprised and really amazed because, and then the next time we'll look at the prodigal son. And I was really amazed because I never put the three together. I've I've never seen anybody do it. I don't know. It may have been done because I haven't seen everything everywhere, but I never heard it. These three totally different passages, the woman with the issue of blood, healing, uh, David and Goliath killing giants, overcoming problems, and then the prodigal son who got in trouble because of his own decision, right? I never saw them put together, but it's amazing how all of these principles that we talk about are found in all three passages. To me, that tells me that these are real foundational basic principles and universal principles and really important, right? So the passage is in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and it's a long passage. So we're not going to read uh, every single verse. I can't. I have to pick out whatever uh, applies to these principles. So the, you know the story, right? So here's the setup. Uh, we'll look at, start with verse 3. Verse 3 says this, that, uh, uh, next slide, go on. Uh, the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with valleys between them. So here's a setup. I have a picture. I like pictures. You know that. Look at the picture. So the setup is like this. There's two rolling hills. These are not huge mountains. This is, by the way, a picture of the Valley of Elah, where we believe that uh, this battle took place. All right? So two rolling hills like this. Picture is taken from one hill. The other hill is in front. And so the soldiers are there on top of the hill. And then <clears throat> what happened is every morning, this huge, ugly uh, uh, a person called Goliath, all right, described in detail, very tall, strong, scary, a giant, armed to the teeth, would come down into the valley, so where that road is, right? And he would yell at the, because the armies were on top of the hills, yell at the armies of the top, uh, uh, the, the Israeli, uh, the Israelites, and Saul and his soldiers, and uh, basically threatened them. And they were paralyzed with fear. I'm going to say this applies because Goliath represents, is the archetype, is the uh, uh, representation par excellence of problems. We all face Goliaths in our lives. Whatever that repetitive, uh, persistent problem or mountain, Goliath is Old Testament for New Testament mountain. When Jesus said, speak to the mountain, uh, it's, it's, it's Goliath, it's a problem. Amen? And so, we're going to read now verse 8, 9, and 10. Verses 8, 9, and 10. So, verse 8. So, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. So, he's taunting them. He's in the valley taunting them. He's bothering them. He's harassing them. See, that's what Jesus said to speak to the mountain, because if you don't speak to the mountain, the mountain will speak to you in your head, doesn't it? You'll never make it, you'll never make it, you'll never make it. You'll die young, you'll die young, you'll die of cancer, you'll die of cancer. All your relatives uh, died of a heart attack. You're going to have a heart attack, you're going to have a stroke. The mountain speaks, Goliath speaks, right? So why are, you, uh, why are you all coming out to fight? I'm the Philistine champion. You're servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me, verse 9. And... Uh, I, if he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. Verse 10. And I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight for me. So he's taunting them. It's the voice that says, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. You're a failure. Uh, uh, you uh, are, uh, were born on the wrong side of the tracks. You uh, come from the wrong family, so you'll never make it, you'll never make it, you'll fail, you'll never make it, you'll never make it, you'll fail. And so, verse 11 gives us a response of the people, and they were terrified. Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. 
You ever been afraid? So they were paralyzed with fear. It's, it's, it's how you feel if the doctor says, we found a lump and it's cancer. Or something like that. Or the boss says, uh, you're fired, you lost your job, we have to let you go. That type of fear, right? It's paralyzing. It could be paralyzing. So they're terrified. And it's amazing because Saul was taller than anybody else. Remember King Saul? He was strong, armed to the teeth, trained in warfare. And then he had a whole army. And, and Saul and the whole army was paralyzed. They were terrified with fear, right? And then verse, verse 16 tells us this, that Goliath kept on doing this over and over and over and over and over and over again. Forty days every morning, and evening, the Philistine champions uh, strutted in front of the Israeli army. So he's strutting his stuff, you know. And he's doing this over and over and over and over again. So put it together. This is an equivalent blow, a devastating blow, equivalent to the woman last week that, that the doctor said, we can't do anything for you, right? But it's different. This is more any problem, anything that you have that looks really big, that is persistent, that doesn't seem to go away, and that you want to change, you want to overcome, you want to change, and you want to turn things around. That's what this is about this morning. And these principles that we're talking about, this, really we're talking about the spirit of faith. We're breaking down the spirit of faith, what it is and how it works. And if we do this, we can overcome any problem, any mountain, any difficulty, any, any giant. So we're interested, like last week, remember, we're, we're interested now in this teaching. What was in, we want to get inside their head. We want to get inside David's head. What was he thinking? What was he saying? Why is he the only one that decided to face a giant when there was a whole army that could have faced the giant? Because, and, I, and it's amazing how much insight Scripture gives us into his thinking, his thought. We don't have to guess. We're told, I'm picking passages where we are told by the Holy Spirit what they said and what they thought. So we don't have to guess. And then, but today something happened that's different. This day something happened and things began to change, right? So what happened? Well, what happened <coughs> is in verse 23, right? It says, as he was speaking, the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, was coming down from the battle lines of the Philistines. He spoke the way he usually did, said this same thing, come on, you're too coward, I'm going to fight you, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to kill you. But you see, the last part of the verse says, but David heard it. That's what changed today. David heard it. Someone who believes in God and walks by faith heard it. Saul heard it every day. The soldiers heard it every day. They processed it differently. But this day is different because this young person, young, inexperienced, unlikely candidates. Don't ever say that God won't choose you because God specializes in choosing people that, that you think they could never do this. And people look at me, I'm talking, right? I got the verses, I do this. And they say, you were born like this. My mom is sitting right there, she can tell you. I was born an introvert. What you see is the anointing of God. I like to be alone. I didn't want to talk to people. I was afraid of talking, ne never mind in front of a crowd. That was unthinkable. I was afraid of talking to one person. Talking to one person was too much. Talking to new people, I would freeze. Privately, I'm kind of still like that, you know. If you don't talk to me, I won't talk to you. Not because I'm mean, just because I'm introverted. I'm a quiet person, right? But the, then when the anointing comes, it all changes. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think of it. I'm an unlikely candidate. I'm not a likely candidate to be chosen by God. I'm an unlikely candidate. I wanted to do something else with my life, Right? Some were technical, procedural, alone, like probably in, in, a, in, in the cockpit of an airplane, piloting an airplane, you know, where everything is systematic. And what, because I drive, I drive people nuts sometimes with how systematic I am, right? 
But there are jobs where you want the person to be systematic. I don't want the pilot to close his eyes, pray in tongues, be led or whatever. I want him to follow the checklist to a T. Right? If you're like a free spirit, do something else. Don't be a pilot. Right? You with me? So here he is. David is unlikely. He's not <laughs> the one that we would choose. Right? And he heard that. So you remember that it starts with what? What does it start with? It starts with the letter D. 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 Decision. Everybody say decision. decision. Right? It all starts. Turning things around is not magic. It's not if God wants to. See, that's heavy for religion. But because God wants to. See, how do you know? Because you already said enemies come against you and they're supposed to run away from you. You're not supposed to run away from enemies. Enemies are supposed to run away from you. You're not supposed to run away from difficulties. Difficulties are supposed to run away from you. So he wants to. So at this point, what we're left with is a decision. You can't ask God, God, do you want Goliath defeated? Well, you can ask him, but the answer would be yes. Right? But it's not magic. Someone has to decide to trust God, to walk by faith, and to act on the Word of God. And we're looking at under the hood, right, what this process is like. Because that's easily done. Most times, most preachers just say that, just walk by faith. Well, what does that mean? I'm breaking it down for you. This is the second time I don't know how to break it down any more than this. So, it starts with a decision. Now, remember that I'm not, this is not an expository sermon, so I'm not going through every single verse, okay? Later on, uh, David expresses his decision, okay? And he's very clear about his decision. And look at the verse here. Uh, it says, give me the next verse. And, and, and uh, uh, don't worry about the Philistine, David says. I'll fight him. Now, this didn't happen right after. There's things that happen. David comes, he asks uh, what's the loot here? Like, what happens to the person? What does the person who defeat the giant get? And then they hear him, they bring him to Saul, and then he tries on Saul's armor, and it doesn't fit, and then Saul says, you can't do it. So see, obstacle, one obstacle after the another. You can't do it, you're too young, you're inexperienced. The thought would be, well, you're older and more experienced, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> right? And so David says, but see, he decided somewhere along the way, and we see the process, it, it was a decision. There was a moment when he said, I will take care of this. I will fight this giant. It's a moment where he draws the line. Things are changing today. We're going to turn things around. This cannot go on another 40 days. This cannot persist. It's going to change now. It's the equivalent of the woman that said, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment and I will be healed. Do you see it? So it's a decision. It starts with a decision. He decided to do it. Because, and that's the first thing that I wrote, right? Decisions, not circumstances, determine your future. Decisions, not circumstances, determine your future. Decisions, not circumstances, determine your future. Decisions, decisions, not circumstances, even though they're real. Nobody denies the circumstances. The difficulties exist, but you can change it. You can turn things around. You can have a breakthrough by making a decision. <clears throat> right? And here's the interesting thing, right? Ask yourself questions. Why, how was David thinking? How is he different? Couldn't Saul have said this, I'll take care of the giant? Couldn't any captain in the army have said, I'll take care of the giant? I believe they could. Look at verse 24. Look at verse 24 now. When the Israelites saw Goliath, they ran away in terror. So we have to ask ourselves, now, here, here's the point, right? Same circumstance. 
Is the giant the same for Saul and the army and David? Is it the same giant? Is it the same valleys? Is it the same mountains? Is it the same uh, <coughs> words? Is it the same circumstance? So if the circumstance determines your future, then they all should have died. Correct? But it's not the circumstance, it's a decision that makes a difference. So the question is, well, why are they parents? So how can people facing the same circumstance have different uh, reactions? Which, by the way, proves that it's not the circumstance that determines your future, but it's your reaction or your decision that determines your future. This is, this is a clear passage. Even the woman, you know, with the woman, she wasn't the only one that touched Jesus. The Bible says a lot of people touched Jesus. He was crowded. They were surprised. Oh, who touched me? What do you mean who touched me? You're surrounded, right? But she's the only one that, see, it's available to everybody, but few show up to get it. Are you going to be the one that shows up to get what belongs to you? Because it's not automatic, right? Any of them could have gotten healed, but just one got it with a woman. Here, any soldier, Saul, it was his responsibility really to take care of this, or any soldier could have done it, but they didn't. So there's a, so same circumstance, but different reaction, right? They are all paralyzed with fear. They're, they're terrorized. David is not. So obviously he's thinking differently, talking differently, behaving differently. Would you like to not be grabbed by fear and terror when bad news comes? Would you like that? Then listen today. Listen to what we're saying today from the Bible. It's a great way to be. Ah, I'm not going to let this move me. I'm not going to let me free. I'm not going to let this freeze me <coughs> with fear. Right? So now we look under, because we're, we're zooming in, right? We're lo looking at, a, at, 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 a, at, a, at, some, at a cell, then we're going to zoom into the molecules, and then we're going to zoom into the atomic level, right? Opening the hood. So what's, what's under the hood of a decision? What, because they all could have made a decision, but they didn't, but David did. So but what, how did he think differently? How did he talk differently? Well, a decision, that's what we talk about, resources, right? You're going to have to, when you make a decision, you're going to have to draw upon some resources and you somehow have to become resourceful. And the decision and the resources feed each other, right? So when you make a decision, you will discover, and when it looks like all hell is breaking loose and not, there's no solution, just make a decision in God and you will find that you have some resources. And then when you find the resources, your decision gets stronger. It's like a, a loop that feeds itself. Right? So the, the resource part is important. You have to get <laughs> resourceful. Right? And, and when, you're, when, you're, when you're paralyzed in terror and fear like this, you think there's no way out. There's no possibility. There are no resources here. There's no alternative. And that's what the fear is designed to do, to make you think that you're stuck in that for the rest of your life, and eventually that will kill you or defeat you. But you have to get reason. And then you find out that even if, if the, in this case, no one else was thinking like this, everybody else is afraid, you know, well, nobody, got it. you find out that in you, in God, you do have some resources. And the resource always starts like this. Do you remember? You use what you have. Use what you have. Now, here's what happened, right? There's things that are, because now we're going to jump to verse 40. But things that happen are like this, that, you know, uh, uh, David went to Saul. Saul gave him his armor. And he looked kind of goofy in it. It didn't work. So he took it off. And he just goes and faces Goliath by himself. But because you can't imitate someone else. You look, you look really, you can learn from other people, but you can't imitate, uh, 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 right? You, you, if someone, if, uh, everybody say concentrate. I'm not going to illustrate that. You know my usual illustration, right? If you know me, you know, I'm just going to keep on going. So here's what David did, verse 40. Look at this, this is like really different. Verse 40, verse 40, verse 40. Next verse, just push the button. Push the button, I'll tell you. So he, 
he had a sling, and he found five smooth stones. He has a staff, four things, a shepherd's bag, a uh, sling, right? It's coming. There you go. You see, I do this so you can follow. You need to check up on me. Always check up on the pastor. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> and check up on him. Before you know, you listen to someone online and just clap like everybody else does. Check. Because it's regular. Someone makes a statement as if it's true, and people are clapping. I wonder, why are you clapping? I can think of 10 scriptures that negate what he just said. See, that's the type. Everybody say, you're not helping me say concentrate. Help me, Sarah. Okay? So, here you go. So, you check, right? He's got his staff, and he picks. You know, you say, what are you, a lunatic? What are you, crazy? He stops, and he picks five smooth stones. Right? And then he puts them in the bag, and his sling, and he walks down in the valley to face Goliath. It's an embarrassing situation. You say, this kid is going to get his head bashed in. That's what people were. He wasn't surrounded by faith. He's surrounded by people like, you are nuts. You are crazy. But, but that's the resource that he had. Right? So he's got the sling and the five smooth stones that concentrate on that. Right? And, and because, remember, to turn things around, you use what you have. You use what you have. You use what you have. I can go through all the major miracles in the Bible, and God always used what was available. Moses, what do you have? A rod. Stretch out your rod. That'll work for parting the Red Sea, right? Yeah, David, what do you have? A sling. Get five stones. We can kill Goliath, right? The woman, what do you have? I got my legs. I got my, my, my strength. I have enough strength to go and push in the crowd and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Thousands of people are hungry. What do we have? We got five buns and five fish. <laughs> right? So you use what you have. Is that good? And then David, remember that we talked about the, the decision. So what's under the decision now? Okay, we got the resources. What goes along with that? Along with that goes a desire, a drive. Remember, another term that you can pick whatever you want to. Psychology uses a term. The world uses another term. But the Bible uses it. Hunger, desire, zeal. The Bible calls it zeal. A drive. And David is one of the most, uh, one of the hungriest people on the planet. His hunger is extraordinary, right? And so David says he's curious, right? Verse 26. So he says this. Look at verse 26. He says, so everybody, guys, tell me what's going to happen to the person who kills uh, the Philistine and frees Israel from the disgrace. Because one way that you show hunger is curiosity. One of the killers of this is tradition. Well, why do we do this? Well, because it's always done this way. It's tradition, right? Well, we should say, well, why are we doing this? Why do we do it this way? Why do we do it this way? And how can we do it better? I think I drive my wife and, and the people who help me crazy, especially my family, right? Because I'm all, I'm, I always want to flip everything upside down. I say, well, why do we sing first and then, the, and then the offering and then the announcement and then the sermon? Why not do the sermon first and then the singing and then the announcement? And then the, why not? You know, I'm always asking. Unless I have a directive from the Bible that says, you do not commit adultery, then I'm not curious about that, right? But in these other things, you want to be led by the Spirit, so you always want to ask. And asking questions is, is, how does this work? And why do we do it this way? And why work like that? Now, God, God says, come and reason together with me. If you're asking because you really want to know, he'll reveal things to you. <laughs> does that make sense? So he's got drive. He's got zeal. Right? And then look at this also. And then he's also, he's so zealous that he's indignant. The last part of the verse, who, who, who is this heathen Philistine? No, no, stay there. I said the last part of the verse, yeah. 
who is this Philistine, right? We're supposed to be in verse 26. Who is this Philistine to defy the army of the living God? So he's curious. You, you, see, you see his dialogue, how he's approaching and talking about it. He says, like, who, modern translation, who the heck are you? Who do you think you are? Come on, somebody, who can do this with attitude? Come on, do it, come on. <laughs> give me some attitude. Come on, come on, give, come on, give it to me. Thank you. She's helping. Come, come here. Come here quickly. Come, yeah, come here. Yeah, go, fast. Run. Fast. Come on. You got to do this with, like you did. There. I don't have the head, the neck. Just give me attitude. Come on. Who do you think? Who do you think you are? Yeah. Wait, wait. Come here. Come here. Come here. Do it again. I wish I could do this. Come on. Come on. Do it. Who do you think you are? Yeah. Give a good hand clap. Thank you. That's good. That's how it's done. So picture this, right? You got a report. Now this is not. This is not. This is not to a person. It's to the problem. That says you have a lump. You get in the car by yourself and you talk to the lump. You talk to the mountain. You talk to the tree. You talk to the Goliath. And instead of being overcome by fear, you talk to the lump and you say, "Who do, who do you think you are? <laughs> that you can kill me? I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God." I'm a child of God. Who do you think you are? Is that different from terror and running away? Is that magic? No, it's a decision. It's a decision. It's a decision. You decide that. Right? You can add a colorful metaphor if it works. Who the heck do you think you are? Yeah, because the uncircumcised or heathen is a metaphor there. The old translation says this, this, this uncircumcised, this heathen, like, who the heck do you think you are? Does that make sense? So this brings us then to our second main point, second main point which is what? Do you remember? The internal dialogue. Ever say internal dialogue. How you talk to yourself, right? This is already an insight here into how David talked to himself, Right? You ready? Uh, I think we're going to go to verse 35 now. Okay. 35, 36, and 37, I think. Right? Go push the button. Next verse. Just go to the next verse. Glory. <clears throat> now look at here. It's 45. I was close. That's why you have to check, right? I always get the content right. Once in a while I miss the number. 35. David, 45. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Go, go, push, go. Next verse, come on. And then, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down, I'll cut off your head. I will give your carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. Next verse. And those gathered here will know that it is by, not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle of the Lord and he will give you into my hands. Yeah. Now is that over the top internal dialogue or what? Yeah. In religious circles that dialogue will get you in trouble. They'll say you arrogant, you who do you think you are? Yeah. Right? Well, because you say, God lives in me. I have the life of God. I've been delivered from the power of darkness. There's no problem that can defeat me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Christ and I are a majority, right? Who does this problem think it is? And I am the righteousness of God. I have the mind of Christ. I'm going to take this problem, cut it, chop it up to bits, crush its head in, and feed it to the birds, because I'm an overcomer. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's why. Different from me. Uh, that never works for me. <laughs> do, you see the do you see the difference? Well, what about you? Yeah, it doesn't work for me. Remember the last time we saw a contrast between then the life story. Right? 
And story means is a good way, biblical way, these are all stories, right? Real stories, but they're all stories of how you talk to yourself. You realize you're talking to yourself all the time. Even as I'm talking to you, you're thinking, boy, I like this or no, I don't like this. I'm getting hungry, where am I going to eat? This is what I'm preaching, right? I don't like it, it's time to stop, cut the sermon down, you know, look at what time it is, right? You know, you're always talking to yourself. So one way or another, you're always talking to yourself. You got up this morning and you said, I'm going to wash, I'm going to get dressed. To get up, you have to say, I'm going to get up in your head, don't you? I'm going to brush your teeth, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, right? Look at the power of story. Think of a pink elephant now. Think of a big, huge pink elephant. Can you picture it here in front next to me? Go, right? A big pink elephant, right? Now, here's the power of story. Were you thinking about a pink elephant before I mentioned it? See? But when I mentioned it, you were thinking about it. It's not weird. I'm making a point. My point is that what you think about and what you concentrate on uses up your resources, right? Occupies your mind. So the way to get rid of fear is not to be fearful, not to think about fear, cast your cares on the Lord, and replace is you have to talk to yourself. You can't just say, I will not be afraid, 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 because you're going to be afraid because you're, you're talking about not being afraid. You have to change the talk, right? Do, do you see him doing it here? And he had all the prerequisites. Now, we don't know much about the woman last week, but we know a lot, we know a lot about David's background. You know that in the chapter before this, uh, <clears throat> Samuel, the prophet, legendary, went to anoint king, uh, went to anoint a king. He went to Jesse's house. <clears throat> Jesse is David's father, right? And they parade all the brothers in front of them. By the way, four of them were in the army paralyzed at this moment. And then Jesse said, Samuel asked Jesse, are these all the sons? He said, no, I got one more son. But, well, read it in verse 11, right? Uh, are these all your sons? Well, there's a youngest. He's the youngest. He doesn't come much. He's out there feed, watching sheep and goats. So here's his background. The prophet didn't believe in him. His father did not believe in him. That, that'll have an impact in your life, Right? His father did not have plans of grandeur for David. He thought, you know, this kid is not going to do much. The best thing that we can do is throw him in the... He won't do much harm there if we just put him there watching sheep and goats. But he paraded all the presidential ones, the elder, all of them. So David could have said when he came, right... Because the story doesn't end here. You know why David is there? He's not there to fight the battle. Are you listening? He's not there to fight the battle. He's there to bring bread and cheese. His father said to him, this is verse 17. So push, go back to chapter, this should be verse 17, right? Push, next verse. Uh, Jesse said to David, his father said, take Uh, grain, ten loaves, carry them to your brothers, next verse, and then he said, give these cheese to the captain, see how your brothers are doing, and come back and tell me how they're doing. So it's not even his battle. So he's there as a servant, and he's bringing bread and cheese, finding out how the captain and his brothers are doing, and coming back and giving a report to his dad, And apparently the captain and his brothers were not doing too well. They were paralyzed with fear. (laughs) Right? So what a story. The prophet did not believe in me. My father did not believe in me. He never think I could amount to anything. And then, you know, he just sent me here. I'm just here to bring some bread and cheese. And bring back a report. But something happened because you, can, you can't keep someone that has a spirit of faith down. You can't, it doesn't matter what you do to them, they, they, will, they, they, they will always rise up. Right? And then on top of it, to add 
what do you say, insult to injury? Is that how you say it? Or injury to insult? It's one of the two. Say it right for me. What do you add? Insult to injury, right? When he got there, his older brother, <laughs> verse 28, you're going to have to skip a couple of slides, I think. Verse 28 uh, Eliab, the older brother, so now he's the presidential one. He's the first one that we thought was going to be president, leader, he's a captain. He's armed to the teeth. He went to, he went to political school. He went to West Point. He knows how to fight. He knows how to use the sword. Eliab, the older brother, right, uh, he turned to him and he asked, and he's angry. He says, well, why, why have you come, why'd you come here for? And, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? There's a few just to drive it. But he's taunting him. He's putting him down. So now, now we have a clear picture of his background, right? But David, very unlikely to become king, the most famous king in Israel. The few, just not even sheep, just drive it home. The few sheep. The few sheep, right? And why, why, why did you come here? I know how conceited you are. And, and how wicked your heart is, because you came here only to do the button. But I would answer, no, I came here to obey, to obey, Dad, because he told me to bring you bread and cheese and see how you're doing. And I'm going to go home now and tell him that you're not doing too well. <laughs> Pay him back for all the, because this went on throughout all, all childhood, right? You're not doing too well. So put it all together. Do you see it? Could David, I don't know about the woman, because I don't have enough background. Last week I'm talking about. But I have enough background to say this. this so authority didn't believe in him. His father didn't believe in him, right? Uh, 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 he, had, he had a background of watching sheep, and, and his brothers constantly picked on him. What happened to you? Maybe your story is that. Your parents didn't believe in you. Maybe, maybe they were absent. Maybe, maybe your dad left. Maybe your mom left. Maybe they divorced, whatever. Maybe they mistreated you. Maybe they made fun of you. Maybe they talked to you like that. Now, who do you think you are? You'll never amount to anything, right? Now you have a choice. Now you have a choice. We're talking about decision and internal dialogue. You either keep that story going and it might work because it shields you from pain, Right? But what it does is it kills zeal, it kills hunger, it kills, it keeps you in prison. Because if you follow that storyline in your head, you say, well, it's no use if Saul can't defeat him, and my older brother can't defeat him, and this whole army cannot defeat the problem, then I'm not going to try because it's always this way, nothing will change, and I'll just go back home, tuck my tail between my legs and go back home and say, that's it, that's the end of this. But remember, <coughs> you remember, right? I'll tell you what now, right? When I pick that out of my spirit. <laughs> you remember that biography, right, your history, what happened to you, right, does not determine destiny either, right? Biology doesn't determine. It may have been like that, but you don't have to stay there. How do you change it? Through a decision. How do you change it? Through how you talk to yourself. Right? Is that how you do it? Now we're going to go, I think it's verse 37. 37, 38, and 39 we're going to read quickly. Go. 37, 38, just push and go. 37, uh, uh, two slides. So here you hear his dialogue again. We're talking about how he talked to himself. He reminds himself and so he says you know I was young and a lion came when I was watching the sheep right and I was keeping the fire sheep when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from food verse 35 and then he says right I went after it struck it and rescued the sheep from the mouth when I turned it turned on me I seized it by its head hair struck it and killed it in verse 36 right it says in the next verse and that I've done this to both lions and bears, and I will do this to this Philistine too. Do you see his dialogue? Do you see his dialogue? Now this is what I, do you remember my pink elephant experiment? Do you remember that? If you think the pink elephant, your, your focus and your attention is going to be on the pink elephant, 
And if you think about the giant and how things never change, your focus and your attention are going to be on that, and it will cause fear, and it will feed fear. So you have to change your dialogue, right? You have to change your dialogue because what you focus on, so now we're looking under the hood, under the hood of, 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 of the, not just the decision, but the dialogue too. What's under there? Well, it's not magic. If I focus on problems and negative things, right, then uh, uh, you're going to be full of that. I'm happy to report to you that I have not watched the news in two weeks. Now, you don't have to do that. I'm just saying this because I do, here's what I decided, right? I do not want to know the intimate detail of a sex scandal of, 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 a, of, a, of a man and an encounter that he had with a porn star. I don't, the world is consumed by that. I don't want to know it. I don't care. In the end, it's called gossip. And it's consuming people. Tell you, every, every time I turn on to look at the feed, I'm looking at the thing and this comes up and I'm not looking for it. I'm trying to stop these things and they come up. And, I don't want to know. I don't care. But I do, but for a different reason. And I can find out what I need to know uh, uh, by looking at summaries, I'm saying, you understand what I'm saying? Being consumed with it, where that's all you think about, talk about, dream about, and it's your every conversation. It will take you off track. So here, if you're thinking because focus, what you focus on is your attention, right? Focus on the pink elephant, that's all you think about. Focus on the lump, that's all you think about. Focus on how big the problem, that's all you think about. Use focus like David did. This, by the way, is the proper use of the past. We, I say to you that you cannot live in the past, and it's true. But the prop, David is an expert at the proper use of the past. You use the past by looking at how God got you out of something in the past, and because he did it in the past, he's going to do it again now, today, in the present, even though it looks helpless and hopeless. We all have something in the past. You know, I remember how when we first started out, it didn't look like we were going to be able to pay the rent. <laughs> and, and it came right down to the day that we weren't able to pay the rent. But the owner, who, was a, who wasn't even saved, called me in and said, you know, we like what you do, and I'm going to write off the rent for three months as a business expense. I didn't understand what that meant, but I don't care what, how, what, you know, what, what God uses and how. But I said, sure. So we had to give him a receipt for the offering, but it was an offering, it was the end of the year, and he wrote it off. And I said, God did him, right? So this month, if it looks like I'm not going to be able to pay the rent, if God did it back then, he can do it now. <laughs> right? Remember about the time that, you know, uh, the relationship failed, and you say, you're going to die, it's going to fall apart. Well, you're still here. <laughs> right? Or maybe you were fired, but you're still here. Or it looked like you weren't going to get the job, but God did it. So the proper use of the past is the lion came. The bear, that was just practice, right? That, the lion and bear was practice for the giant. And the problem gets bigger and bigger, and the victories get bigger and bigger, right? So when you focus, you decide what you can control. Can you control what Samuel thinks? No. Can you control what Saul thinks? No. Can you control what your brothers think? No. Can you control what people around you think? No. Can you control what your parents think? No. Can you control what the boss thinks? No. Can you control what politicians think? Heck no, nobody can, right? But I can control what I think. I can control what I focus on. I can control my story. I turn the news off. And when the verdict is in, I'll look at the headline. Guilty or fun, that's all I want to know so I can pray. But I do not need to be caught up with every single detail of something that, that, that is, you, you get caught up in. It's called use, but it's gossip. I don't care about the big brother, the elephant, the Kardashian sister. I don't, I don't want, if I live my own life, not other people. We become a nation of voyeurs. Watching other people live, you need to live your story. It's all designed to hypnotize us and dull us. And I do care for their souls. 
So I care for the president's soul. I care for the prosecutor's soul. I care for the lawyer's soul. I care for the Kardashian souls. I care for the soul of everyone that's on Big Brother. So when I say I don't care, it's the wrong word. I got to find a better one. But I do. But I'm not getting caught in the trap of using my mind, my thoughts, my words, my resources and that because it will drag me down. <clears throat> right? And use what you have. And I'm going to wrap up because we're, we're not skipping the Lord's Supper. Use what you have. What did David have? He had his God. He had his faith. He had his mind. He had his heart. He had his mouth. He had his staff. He had his bag. He had his sling. He had the five smooth stones. And he had all the past stories. You have stuff like that too. It's all stuff that you have. <sighs> right? Then you, but notice that the battle is the Lord's. Everybody say the battle is the Lord's. The Lord's. So does that mean you lie on the couch, not do anything? You just say, God, if you do it, right? Yeah, because the battle is the Lord's means you have to do the talk. Like the battle of the Lord's means this is you are the one that's going to go naked in front of the giant with a slingshot and five stones and have to trust God. You got to put yourself on the line. You got to have courage because it takes courage and, 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 and you got to be like in some craziness, nuts. You got to be nuts to go down in front of this guy that can chop you to bits with just a sling and a few stones, right? So then he goes down in front of, in front, right? It should be verse 42 if I'm right this time, right? Verse 42. So he goes down. The Philistine looked at David, despised him. Like it doesn't end. Father, brother, authority, Saul, even his enemies despise him. He said, Doc, who are you? You're a runt. This is the equivalent of like a runt. Like you're handsome, like you're good looking, but you're a runt. He had that going for him. He was like GQ. David would have made the cover of GQ magazine, right? Handsomest man in Israel was David, right? A babe. <laughs> He said, but you're like a runt. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tear you apart. Right? Let's read the next verse too. And, and, then, and then David said, and then he said, that, he said, what's that stick you have? He came up with a stick. It's like, what do you think, I'm a dog? You can, you know, like what, 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 right? And he called, and then he cursed him. You, well, fill in. He's swearing his head off. May Baal curse you, Baal, hell, Baal, they, because in, in his gods, his god, the Philistines' god were God, right? He's cursing him. Now you have the decision to make if they're going to face this or not. It's intimidating, isn't it? People behind you are not praying for you or believing. They're like saying you're nuts. You know, the brother and the dad are already making plans for the funeral here. So what? What does David do? What does David do? Right? 39, all right? 38 and 39, verse 38 and 39. We'll conclude with that, right? 48 and 49, you're right. The Philistine moved closer. What did David do? He ran quickly toward the battle line. So David is so nuts that when, when, when you know, when Goliath approaches, everybody else is running away. Goliath starts to approach and David runs toward, he doesn't run away, he runs towards him. Now, that must have freaked Goliath out by itself. He said, was this guy coming after me with a stick? And I was like, what is this, right? Must have disoriented him just enough for David to, and then verse 49, David, right, he reached into his bag, he took out a stone, struck it in the Philistine on the forehead, and it sank into his forehead, and he fell down on the ground. See, the internal dialogue, right? The others were saying, he's too, the problem is too big. It will defeat us. David is thinking, he's so big, I can't miss. <laughs> right? He just goes, so, poof, poof. now, that's what it means the battle is the Lord's. It's your courage. It's you on the line. It's your mind. It's your words. It's your faith. It's your decision. It's your reaction. But then you come you come, you come, when you do this, and you step out in courage like that, you come face to face with omnipotence, with God's 
power. Right? Because the woman pushed, she touched, but it wasn't the, the hem that healed her. It was Jesus' power that healed her. And David just went like this. It wasn't the stone that killed him, but it was God. God supercharged that. God did something, and God intervened, but he needed the sling and the stone and someone to step up. Do you see it? And everything changed that day, turned around. The situation was unblocked. It was a breakthrough. It was a turnaround, right? The, the, the problem was solved. Uh, uh, the, the, the army was freed from fear, right? They won. They won a decisive battle. And you know what happened that day? Here's the power of the decision, right? That day, David never went back to watching sheep again. It was the beginning of his journey to Jerusalem and to the throne and to the crown and to becoming king. So that time when you said, well, it's no use, you know, to try relationship again because it didn't work the last time, is when you may have missed your crossroad to a new relationship. Because that's what the other story does. It keeps you prisoner. It keeps you from trying again, right? Yeah, I did apply for a job. It didn't work, but you know what? I'm going to try again. Because God supplies my need, because I believe Him, because I trust Him. Do you believe that? I believe firmly that anyone that, that saw the older brother or any soldier could have done this. Do you believe it? If they had made the decision, if they had changed their story, if they had changed how they talked to themselves, if they had trusted God. It's available to anybody. I'll tell you why. I First John 5, that's my last scripture, so go down to the last scripture that says, uh, every child of God defeats the world. Winning belongs to every child of God. And the victory, though, is what? Our faith. But you're going to have to use your faith to overcome. 